a young man and a young woman sat down together in the shade of the trees at the bottom of a garden in an English village and read poems to one another. Neither Willie, an apprentice carpenter, nor his friend Laura, a post office worker, had more than the most basic formal education, and they owned no more than a handful of books between them. But Willie did own an anthology of poetry, so that was what they read. There were probably many scenes of reading similar to this across the country and across the century, which have left no historical trace. This one survived because it was recorded in Flora Thompson's slightly fictionalised memoir of village life, Candleford Green, from 1943, part of her trilogy, Lark Rise to Candleford, 1945. Laura is Thompson's alter ego. Flora becomes Laura. This is what she says. Willie was fond of reading too, and did not object to poetry. Somehow he had got possession of an old shattered copy of an anthology called A Thousand and One Gems, and after office hours, Laura and he would sit among the nut trees at the bottom of the garden and take turns at reading aloud from it. Those were the days for Laura when almost everything in literature was new to her, and every fresh discovery was like one of Keats's own magic casements opening on the foam. Between the shabby old covers of that one book were the Ode to a Nightingale, Shelley's Skylark, Wordsworth's Ode to Duty, and other gems which could move the heart, which could move to a heart-shaking rapture. Anthologies, as this passage indicates, were very widely read, even, perhaps especially, among those who had access to very few books. As the new time of modernity took hold, leisure emerged as a distinct kind of time that was defined by not being work, but that had to leave you refreshed to return to work. Anthologies became the delivery system for literary leisure in capitalist modernity, injecting bite-sized chunks of culture into the intervals of a life of labour. Francis Turner Palgrave imagined his golden treasury being picked up in what he called the scanty hours that most men spare for self-improvement. In Thompson's description, the book's superior contents is at odds with its inferior form, which is old, shabby, and shattered. Anthologies had difficulty including more than the briefest extracts from many of the long poems that we now think of as crucial texts of Romanticism. And to handle this difficulty, I'm going to suggest, 19th century anthologies functioned like magic casements opening on the foam. They offered a portal to the oceanic breadth of Romantic poetry, while also framing and limiting the reader's view of it. Thompson's description hints at how anthologies affected the reception of their contents. Obviously, the anthologists' choices determined what the anthology's readers read, obviously. But the anthology's paratexts also shaped how the poems it contained were read. In this passage, for example, the word gems, which the anthology uses in its title, quietly becomes Thompson's own in the following paragraph. Her description of the poems that were held in that one book endorses the anthology's self-depiction as a casket of jewels overflowing with treasure, a magic box containing multitudes, a window onto an undreamt-of world. Over the last few years, I've completed a survey of 210 literary anthologies published in Britain between 1822, when Percy Shelley died, and the end of the century. The corpus includes several different kinds of anthologies, produced in different formats, aimed at different readers, intended for different kinds of use. There are duodecimos and quartos, single and multi-volume works, books aimed at children and adults, men and women, books for recitation, study, self-culture and pleasure. There were certainly other literary anthologies published in Britain in this 78-year period, but these books provide a substantial sample. I examined each of the 210 books with the help of some student assistants, and recorded information about the front matter and the arrangement of contents, as well as each poem or extract from a poem by Lord Byron, Felicia Hemans, or Percy Shelley that appeared in them. 
The resulting database is a powerful research tool. It contains details of 210 anthologies, containing 1,055 poems or extracts from Byron, 554 from Hemans, and 402 from Shelley. So that gives you an idea of the relative popularity of those three poets in the anthologies. Flora Thompson's Laura found in Willie's anthology a magic casement that opened onto the ocean of literature, but framed, shaped, and limited her view of it. I use a quantitative survey of a corpus of anthologies, alongside close readings of some examples, as a similar kind of casement, though not a magic one, that can reveal the role the anthologies played in reception history. Now, if you're interested in learning more about what I found out about the anthologies, it's all coming out in my new book, What the Victorians Made of Romanticism, uh, which is about to be published. And today, though appropriately for this conference, I want to focus on the story of uh, P.B. Shelley in the anthologies. There are two parts to this story. The first part is how the anthologies um, favoured and popularised some of Shelley's shorter lyrics, lyrics that Percy Shelley himself thought of as comparatively marginal to his oeuvre as a whole. The second part, and the part I'm going to focus on today, is how the anthologies handled some of Shelley's long poems. Faced with Queen Mab, Alastor, and the Cenci, anthologists often looked for passages of natural description that they could extract. With its youthful radicalism and outspoken attacks on religion, monarchy, and contemporary society, Queen Mab was especially difficult for the anthologists to handle. Its publishers had been successfully prosecuted in the past, so editors and publishers had to be cautious about excerpting it in anthologies. Nonetheless, we found extracts from it in 11 books. The most commonly anthologised passage from Queen Mab was the opening of Canto IV, which was reprinted eight times. The Literary Gazette, in its otherwise very hostile review from 1821, had singled out this passage as the noblest piece of poetry the author ever imagined. It begins with this description of night. How beautiful this night, the balmiest sigh which vernal zephyrs breathe in evening's ear were discord to the sleeping quietude that wraps this moveless scene. Heaven's ebon vault, studded with stars unutterably bright, through which the moon's unclouded grandeur rolls, seems like a canopy which love had spread to curtain her sleeping world. The passage goes on to describe the snowy hills surrounding the speaker and the castle visible in the distance, whose banner hangeth o'er the time-worn tower so idly that rapt fancy deemeth it a metaphor of peace. These lines provide the only hint of discord in the scene, in their faint suggestion that only rapt fancy would see the flag as a metaphor of peace, while a more clear-eyed and disenchanted observer might see it as a sign of strife. The speaker then reflects that the scene is one where musing solitude might love to lift her soul above this sphere of earthliness, where silence undisturbed might watch alone, so cold, so bright, so still. Five anthologies stopped there, while another three extended the passage for another uh, 50 lines or so to line 70. Queen Mab employs a fantastical, romantic uh, setting to introduce the religious and political polemic that appears both in the poem's central cantos and in the prose notes on free love, necessity, atheism, Christian dogma, and vegetarianism. The Literary Gazette found this passage from the start of Canto IV acceptable, even noble in their word, because it bore no trace of Shelley's opinions on these topics. By extracting calm moments such as this, this description of night, anthologies inoculated themselves against Queen Mab's radical content protected themselves against prosecution, and reiterated their focus on Shelley's lyrical and descriptive poetry. Alastor received some similar treatment. It appeared in ten of the anthologies surveyed. One anthology quoted almost the whole poem, a 
apart from a section of 132 lines describing the poet's physical decline, apparently cut for length, I think. The other nine books that uh, included some of the last door all excerpted the poem, quoting seven distinct passages between them. Now, six of those passages only appeared in one or two books, but one of those passages appeared in five books, and it's this kind of consistency between anthologies that I'm looking for when I do this survey to see what passages are coming back a number of times. So what passage of the last door came back several times? It was a description from the middle of the poem of a well in a shady forest. Four books quoted this whole section, uh, section from line 420 to 468, a 48-line section. One uh, book quoted only the last 15 lines. It's a dense, slow-moving passage of lush description in which Shelley enumerates the trees in the wood, the oak, beech, cedar, ash, and acacia, the flowers that grow around them, starred with 10,000 blossoms, the intertwining leaves in the canopy which make network of the dark blue light of day, and the mossy forest floor, fragrant with perfumed herbs. He then turns to the well, whose liquid surface reflects the forest canopy, the stars twinkling through the branches, the birds asleep in the trees, and the insects of the wood. The passage is pervaded by anthropomorphic tropes of beauty and love, as though the flora and fauna of the forest were a loving family or community. We had a similar idea in Kelvin's uh, lecture yesterday. It's this uh, forest is nature's dearest haunt, where the oak, expanding its immense and knotty arms, embraces the light beach, and the creepers twine around the trees as gamesome infants' eyes with gentle meanings and most innocent wiles fold their beams around the hearts of those that love. The overlapping tree branches are wedded boughs, and the creepers unite their close union. Even the insects are described as gorgeous. Time seems suspended here. The forest's dense canopy creates a perpetual twilight, making the dark blue light of day seem like night, and the night's noontide clearness seem like day. Stillness reigns both day and night. The surface of the water in the well is never disturbed by anyone using it. It reflects a sleeping bird by night, an emotionless insect by day, but nothing that moves. In other words, it's a kind of islanded moment of stasis. Immediately after this passage, the poet re-enters the poem on his quest, but the anthologies were not concerned with him. Their interest in Alastor, like their interest in Queen Mab, was in its passages of natural description, especially those that took place in a suspended lyrical present, free from narrative, tension, and decay. In this, they followed some of the poem's <coughs> first reviews. The eclectic review called Alastor a heartless fiction that failed in accomplishing the legitimate purposes of poetry. But the reviewer conceded that it cannot be denied that very considerable talent for descriptive poetry is displayed in several parts. So Shelley is being um, constructed here through the anthologies as a poet of lyricism and description, particularly through these extracted passages of suspended lyric present. The most anthologised passage from the Chenchi was also a natural description. Seven anthologies included lines from the play, with some including more than one extract, but five of those anthologies included the same description of a rocky landscape from Act 3. Beatrice speaks these lines, describing to Lucretia and Orsino the spot where Count Cenci can be ambushed and killed. Like the passage from Alastor, this passage describes a wooded landscape with cedars and yews and pines, and a place of shadows. At noonday here it is twilight, and at sunset blackest night. But unlike the Alastor landscape, this landscape in the Cenci, as befits the atmosphere of the play, is sinister with a mighty rock which hangs over a gulf with terror and with toil, even as a wretched soul hour after hour clings to the mass of life. 
in his preface to the Chen Chi, Shelley singled out this passage as the only one in the play that could be described as mere poetry. I have avoided, he wrote, with great care in writing this play, the introduction of what is commonly called mere poetry, and I imagine there will scarcely be found a detached simile or a single isolated description unless Beatrice's description of the chasm appointed for her father's murder should be judged to be of that nature. Passages of isolated description were something Shelley sought to avoid in the Chenchi, but they were exactly what the anthologies valued most in his poetry. In Queen Mab, Alastor and the Chenchi, the only passages excerpted in several anthologies were passages of natural description, extracted from their narrative or dramatic contexts. By reprinting these, these passages, the anthologies acknowledged Shelley's achievement as an author of long poems, even though they reprinted his short lyrics much more often, while insulating their readers against the political radicalism of Queen Mab, the heartless poetic quest narrative of Alastor, and the horror and moral complexity of the Chenchi. When they extracted passages of natural description from Queen Mab, Alastor, or the Chenchi, or indeed uh, when they worked in similar but, but importantly different ways on Hemans and Byron, the anthologists weren't seeking a manageable part that faithfully represented the whole. Leah Price, in her book on the anthology and the rise of the novel, writes that each anthology piece functions, at least in theory, as a representative synecdoche for the longer text from which it is excerpted. But all the examples that I've given suggest that the approach of 19th century anthologists to romantic long poems was not fundamentally synecdochal. In extracting these lines from the long poems in which they first appeared, the anthologists sought not a synecdochal excerpt from the longer poem, but a standalone substitute for it. Through these manoeuvres, which were reprised with some important variations for Byron and Hemans, 19th century anthologies occluded most of the lines in most of the long poems that we now think of as among the central texts of Romanticism. The lines they did include were stripped of their poetic context, encouraging readers to approach them as though they were short poems of the kind the anthologies preferred. And this anthological reading protocol, if you like, could be carried over then to the long poems as a whole, or even to an author's collected works. Both could be treated as strings of brilliant gems to be experienced discreetly. How then should we understand the anthology's practice? A pessimistic understanding would dwell on how the anthology censored or misrepresented romantic poetry. And this understanding assumes that the relevant interpretive context for poetry <coughs> is either the author's oeuvre as a whole or the context of the poem's creation and first publication. When the anthologies remove poems from these contexts or remove parts of poems from the context of their uh, original publication, their artistic power and richness seems to be diminished. On this account, on this view, anthologies reduced the formal variety of romantic poetry, marginalising forms of writing that did not share the anthology's focus on lyric brevity, and contributing to the lyricisation of literature in the 19th century. They flattened out the complexities of romantic poetry's speaking voices by obscuring their individualising features. In doing so, they made romantic poetry seem more earnest and less ironic, as though the Isles of Greece were written in Byron's own voice, or Hemans unproblematically endorsed every word of Casabianca. At the same time, they made it seem as though romantic poets could only speak in their own voices, however individualised, while Victorian poets were experimenting with the new form of the dramatic monologue. The anthologies removed poems and excerpts from the context of the poetry that surrounded them, the context of their first publication, and the social, economic, political, and historical contexts of their production. The poems in Willie's anthology were as shattered as the old shattered book itself. Shattered, but not dead. 
A more optimistic reading of the anthology's cultural work would argue that the shattering of romantic long poems was actually key to ensuring their continued vitality. Roland Barthes, in SZ, describes his practice of breaking the text up in the manner of a minor earthquake, he says, into blocks of signification, or lexias, in order to facilitate analysis. He calls the result le texte étoilé. Richard Miller translates étoilé as starred. On étoilera donc le texte. We shall therefore star the text. But it can also be translated as shattered. We shall therefore shatter the text. A shattered car windscreen, for example, can be called étoilé. For Bart, the process of shattering is initiated by the commentator. It is arbitrary in the extreme and produces a broken text, text brisé, which, separated from any ideology of totality, cannot be reassembled. It is therefore part of Bart's project of empowering readers. The text is shattered to make active reading possible. Bart's text étoilé might point the way to a more optimistic reading of the anthology's cultural work. Breaking long poems into short sections made those sections available for reading by people who might otherwise have overlooked them. It must have directed some anthology readers to approach long poems or volumes of collected works wholesale, and it encouraged readers who had already read the long poems to consider parts of them in more detail. Bart's method of shattering the text is a tool in the hands of the empowered reader, but the anthologists used a similar process to administer long poems for readers. Nonetheless, the anthologists could not control the readings that they made possible. The anthologies then propagated new kinds of encounter with romantic poems, some of which, at least, must have been the resistant readings that Michel de Certeau calls poaching. To ask which of these accounts, the more positive, more negative, more optimistic, more pessimistic, which of these is true, is correct, seems to be less important than to acknowledge the extent that, to which they are imbricated uh, with each other. The anthology censored poems in the process of circulating them, but they also, ironically, circulated poems in the process of censoring them. Even poems as ideologically problematic for Victorian audiences as Queen Mab or Don Juan featured in the pages of anthologies, albeit in drastically reduced form and sometimes hedged around with defensive commentary. The anthology made romantic poems conform to Victorian media of cultural transmission, and in the process elided elements of those poems that seemed alien or threatening to Victorian sensibilities. But as they did so, the volumes that I've examined acted as capillaries of cultural transmission, circulating romantic poetry to new generations of readers. While the anthology's paratexts attempted to shape the responses of those readers, they could not finally control them. And so, these 210 books, containing thousands of poems and extracts, produce tens of thousands of moments of reading, some of them culturally dissident, most of them historically fugitive, in schools, evening classes and universities, reading societies and public libraries, at kitchen tables and in attic bedrooms, and in an English village at the bottom of a garden, in the shade of the trees, one warm evening in the 1890s. Thanks.